Good to see you tonight. Now, the really important question before us, how many of you went to the beach today? Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I knew. What a day, huh? What a day. This is when people talk about Cannon Beach, this is what they want. This is what they expect. Not Well, we, we get a lot of days with the rain and the clouds like we had yesterday, but today, kind of day you make a postcard from, so I hope you went to the beach. And how many of you, well, let's just put it this way. How many of you walked down toward Haystack Rock? Raise your hands. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Most of you did that. Marlene and I, we walked toward Haystack Rock and almost got down there. Just a glorious day. And it's hard to believe only one more day to go. What, what fun we've had. And thank you all for coming here at the end of the summer. Could have done a lot of things. And we're so glad that Cannon Beach was designated a hotel a few years ago so we could stay open, right? And that, the Cannon Beach Hotel has been open all summer long by the grace of God, and thank you for being a part of it. And you know, the thing is, I would go. I, I would go to the bingo thing, but you, you mentioned something. You mentioned a $100 bill. I've heard of those. I've seen pictures of those. It's been years since I've had a $100 bill. They don't, they don't really come too close to me. It might be a little more like a $5 bill or something like that. So, good. And who played bingo last night? Good. And who won? Did you, was there a winner? Do you have a, is there a, what? Well, raise your hands if you won anything last night. Okay, good. Now we know. All right, so come tonight. And, and I don't know if there's any money. $25 bills. That'd get me to it. I can bring one. <laughs> I can bring one. Somebody else bring other, another 19. Well, okay. Let me let me show. Ben, if you'd put the slide up here. Uh, that's it. That's it. That's it. Put it up there. Yeah, 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 yeah. KBM is the name, is the initials of our ministry, Keep Believing Ministries. And uh, we have come to YouTube. We have had and a channel on YouTube for all of a week and a half. And we, I mean, literally, we have just opened it up. We've done everything really on Facebook until, until just about a week and a half ago. We've opened it up. Uh, if you want to do anything to encourage our ministry, do this. Go to YouTube, search for Keep Believing Ministries. When you get there, you'll see that our little slogan at the top. That's a picture of me preaching a few years ago at the First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas. And down below, we have loaded up 15 videos that I recorded on Facebook Live in April and May and June going through the book of Daniel. If there was ever a time when we need to get our feet down good in Bible prophecy, this is it. Jesus is coming. I believe he's coming soon. If you're interested in Bible prophecy, all those videos are there, take you through the whole book of Daniel um, you'll just see my smiling face up there. This is a course that I teach at Word of Life Bible Institute all over the world. So we begin each class with a little quiz, kind of fun. Just go through the text. And anyway, go to youtube.com, search for Keep Believing Ministries. When you get there, when you see my face, you'll know you're in the right place, okay? When you get there, little red button up in the top right, click on subscribe. And that's the number one way this week, you could really help us as we begin to build that channel. Thank you very much. Now, over there on that table, uh, we've put out everything we've got, put out the rest of these little uh, keep calm, Jesus is in the boat cards. Now, here's the deal. Tomorrow's our last day. So whatever I said earlier about one per family, forget about it. Just forget about it. Because whatever you take, we don't have to take back home, okay? So the booklets and the wristbands and these little Jesus in the boat cards, take whatever you want. between. And when they're gone, they are gone. And actually, you'll be helping our ministry also that way. So we are in a series called Big Promises. God says you are, you have, you can, you will. So far, we have looked at you are never alone. God's answer to fear. Second, last night we looked at, you have a great future, God's answer to failure. Message number three tonight, from Philippians chapter four, you can live in peace, God's answer to anxiety. 
Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. So I just begin with this question. What is it that you are worried about today? In the last few months, almost everything we have been worried about has been tied into the virus, the pandemic, the coronavirus, COVID-19, and its impact on us and around the world. Recent survey asked the question, what difference in terms of your personal life has the coronavirus made in terms of your anxiety level? 90%, listen to this, 90% of those responding reported increased worry, frustration, boredom, and anger. People reported feeling stress from isolation during the quarantine, worries about their health, fears about their employment, and uncertainty about what would happen to their loved ones. 70% reported that they are worried now about having enough money to survive. That may not have been such a concern in April or in May, but as this thing drags on and on and on, everybody looks at the bottom line, at what comes in and what goes out, and I don't blame anybody for being worried or concerned. Several years ago, before, before all this pandemic, before all the virus stuff, an organization in the United Kingdom called Benenden Health did a survey. They asked the question, what are you most worried about? So this is pre-pandemic, the top 10 things people are worried about. Number 10 was diet. Number nine was job security. Number eight was having enough money to pay the rent or the mortgage. Number seven was credit card debt. Number six was low energy level. Number five was overdrafts and loans. Number four was overall fitness. Number three was lack of savings and worries about the financial future. Number two, fears of growing old. And number one was being overweight, overweight. So let me just say, just in a general comment here, three observations. Number one, these concerns mostly fall into two categories, health and finances. Number two, these are universal human concerns. They were with us before the pandemic. They are certainly with us during the pandemic. And when this thing is finally over, whenever it is finally over, these concerns will still be with us. These are issues that will be with us, number three, for as long as we live. And I think in one sense about worry, if we're worried about worry, we're going to have to die in order to stop worrying because there's a lot of stuff going on in the world to concern us tonight. Now, that same survey asked the question. I'm going to give you, they ask, how much time do you spend worrying? I'm going to give you the numbers from the survey. I'm pretty certain tonight the numbers I'm going to give you actually would be higher here at the first part of September, but they're high enough as it is. How much time on average do you spend worrying? The answer was, in the week, the average person spends 14.3 hours worrying. In a year, that equals 744 hours. In a lifetime, that equals 45,243 hours, 1,885 days, or to say another way, the average person spends over five years of their lifetime doing nothing but being worried about the future. No wonder we have trouble sleeping. No wonder we are under so much pressure. Come to think of it, no wonder our blood pressure is going up and not down. No wonder we find it hard to concentrate. And, and I would observe also, as we think about this, really, for most of us, it's a combination of things. It's job, it's school, it's money, it's work, it's health, it's bills to pay, it's your husband, your wife, your ex-husband, your ex-wife, the in-laws, the kids. And now, we've got all the stuff that's happening in the country. We've got all the stuff that's in the headlines. We've got all the worries about what's going to happen when the weekend gets here. We've got all the health concerns. I mean, we've just got stuff bubbling all around us. Any one thing we could handle. Two things we can handle. But when you get three or four things coming together, your knees start to buckle. Now this, this word worry comes, we are told, from the old English word, wirgan. 
Wirgan. Worry comes from the old English Wirgan. Wirgan. You know what it means? It means to strangle. To strangle. It means to be so worried about whatever it is that you feel you are being strangled. So I have a friend who had a grandchild undergoing serious medical issues. And he wrote me to say how concerned he was for his grandchild. And he said, there's bad news. There's good news. There's confusing news. He said, I feel as if I am on a roller coaster. And then he wrote this sentence to me. Quote, I found that it squeezes my mind quite a bit while trying to do other things. That's interesting if you look at the dictionary and try to get a, a good beginning of what are we even talking about? We're talking about worry. Well, if you want a simple definition, it would be excessive concern for the affairs of life. The only problem with that definition, which is good as it stands, is uh, then you got to go, you got to define what do you mean by excessive? What's the line between normal concern and excessive concern? And I find that's difficult to actually, what I really find in my own life is that line is a moving target. It's here one day and it's here another day. Yet when you read the Bible, it is totally clear. Worry, whenever you cross that line, the line for you may be different than it is for me, but whenever we cross the line from genuine concern into consuming worry, into anxiety, we have committed a sin. It's a sin for two reasons. Number one, because worry displaces God in your life. And number two, it distracts you from what really matters. So I was, I was doing some research for this sermon. And I ran across a statement. Sometimes in my Bible study or reading the commentaries, I, I, I just found something that, and ding, 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 the bells start to ring for me. And I, I ran across this statement. Worry is a form of of idolatry. Yeah, all you guys, you're nodding your heads because you know that. Honestly, I had that thought had never crossed my mind at all, right? I mean, just it just I guess I had idolatry over here and worry over here. Worry's bad, it's a sin, but I really didn't think about it as idolatry. But the writer said it is idolatry. Because when you move from genuine concern into consuming, strangling worry, what it means is at that moment, you are no longer trusting in God. At that moment, God is not in the center of your life. And whatever it is you're concerned about, that thing has moved God away from the center of your life. And so you may hear me say all this, and you may say, you do not know what I am going through. How can I be cheerful when my marriage is falling apart? God seems so far away. If you lived with my husband or my wife, you wouldn't be so happy either. My kids drive me nuts. I've got cancer. How can I rejoice? My son-in-law, my daughter, she's got COVID. It's not good. How can I not worry? I'm stuck and I can't change. People have mistreated me. And I'm not going to be happy until I get even. But if I had more money, I would be happy. So let's just say it this way. You can worry or you can pray. But you can't do both at the same time. Got it? You can worry or you can pray. But you can't do both at the same time. Because worry and prayer are opposites. Like water and fire. So tonight... For just a few minutes, we are coming again to a text you know, you've memorized. But what a wonderful challenge for us tonight. In this text, there is a prohibition, and then there is a precept, and then there is a promise. There's a prohibition first. Do not be anxious for anything. I much, at this point, prefer the old King James Version which is how I learned this a long time ago. What does it say? Be anxious for what? Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything, Paul says. 
And all God's people said, you got to be kidding. Question, where was Paul when he wrote these words? He was in prison. Where was he in prison? He was in prison in Rome. In what kind of prison situation was he in when he was in Rome? We know, we know he was in prison. He was chained. He was most likely chained to four guards at the same time. One here, one here, one here, and one here. So for 24 hours a day, under guard in a Roman jail cell, chained to guards, not knowing when he would get out or if he would get out or if he was going to die in jail. He had plenty to complain about and no doubt plenty to argue about, but he said not a word. Everything was dark to him. He expected death. He was at the mercy of Nero, a bloodthirsty dictator. Yet, he didn't make one word of complaint. When a man like that speaks to us across the centuries and says, be anxious for nothing, I think we should listen to what he says. What is worry? It is, one writer said, stewing without doing. Worry is wrong because it assumes that God cannot take care of you. He promised to care for you, but you are saying when you worry, Lord, I don't believe you can care for me. So I'm going to take matters into my own hands. But God sees the whole picture. Now, key word clearly right here for us at the beginning is nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Now, do you, do you, do you folks know the name J. Vernon McGee? Preached here several times at Cannon Beach. Though he is dead, he still speaks around the world. Taking us all on the Bible bus, right? And you know what J. Vernon McGee said about this? Beloved, may I say to you. He does that. Beloved, may I say to you, nothing means nothing. I like that. Nothing means nothing. It is an utterly exclusive word. It leaves out everything. Worry about nothing because you pray about everything. Worry then is what? It's rat poison to the Christian life. It strangles our joy. It empties our faith. It increases our doubts. It wrecks our testimony. It leaves us exhausted and depressed. So why this command? Well, worry accomplishes nothing. It adds nothing to life. It makes us mind readers and false prophets. It distracts us from our genuine duties. It wears us out, wrecks our testimony. It's a highly contagious virus, and it is ultimately selfish. Another writer said, worry is the interest paid on borrowed troubles. It puts a question mark where God puts a period. And I like this. Worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it won't get you anywhere. And then I discovered this old Jewish proverb, which you folks now can go home and meditate on. Worms eat you when you're dead. Worry eats you when you're alive. That's good. Worms eat you when you're dead. Worry eats you when you're alive. There's a lot of truth down in there. Ponder that. That's the prohibition. We know that. Don't worry about anything. Okay, Paul, we've got that. Do you have any advice for us? Here's the precept. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Paul has three pieces of advice for those of us who worry. Pray about everything and everything by prayer. Pray with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving. Pray with expectation, present your request to God. An old hymn says it this way, Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. So, question tonight, how shall we deal with our worries? Not by trying harder, not by pretending they don't exist, not by positive mental attitude. Paul tells us exactly how we are to deal with the worry syndrome. Number one, he says, by prayer, by prayer. And he chooses a, a Greek word, watch this, a Greek word that means face to face, or maybe even better this way, face to face, right up close. The Lord here and you are here, talking to him directly and personally, face to face to face. 
It speaks not to what we say, but to the attitude of the heart. Listen carefully. Prayer begins with a mood, not with words. Prayer begins with a mood, not with words. Remember, Jesus warned us about the Pharisees who thought they would be heard, what? For their loud, repetitious prayers. And Jesus said, no, no, the Lord knows what you need even before you ask him. Prayer begins with the mood, not with words. Prayer is to the spiritual life what breathing is to the body. It has taken me a lifetime to understand this, and I'm still understanding it. I remember 40-some years ago, young man, freshly graduated from seminary. Marlene and I were out at a small church in Los Angeles. And one night, I went down to, Los, to, to Long Beach, south of where I was pastoring, for a, a rally for youth workers. And a pastor of a large church on the West Coast, young man, got up and he was preaching. He was preaching on prayer that night, preaching from Acts chapter 12, when the answer is knocking at the door. It's a great story. I've forgotten everything, everything that man said, but one story. He said that about a year before, maybe 18 months before, he, he'd gotten a call at the church. His wife had been in a terrible accident, terrible accident, and he should come right now. And he got to the scene of the accident just as they were taking his wife away. She was unconscious and she was in terrible shape. And they let him ride in the ambulance, I think, thinking she would not survive the trip to the hospital. And the man said, the pastor, he said, when I saw my wife's broken body, I just put my arms over her and I tried to pray. And he said, all I could say was, oh God, oh Jesus, oh God, oh Jesus, oh God, oh Jesus. And then he said, it felt like it was the first time I had ever really prayed in my life. All of us have been there, haven't we? In some moment of crisis, have you ever been so shocked and so scared that you couldn't get the words out? That you could not get a coherent sentence out have you ever been so tired that you couldn't pray you just couldn't get the words out i have been there we've all been there james 5 16 says the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous have great power with god that word there for fervent it's the greek word from which we get the word energy or energetic in the first century listen to this that word was used for boiling water boiling water you could legitimately translate it if you wanted to. The boiling prayers of the righteous are very powerful with God. And you say to me, Pastor Ray, what's a boiling prayer? Let me tell you what it's not. It has nothing to do with your posture. It has nothing to do with whether you're seated or standing or whether you're lying prostrate on the ground. It has nothing to do with your hands whether they are folded or raised. It has nothing to do with your eyes, whether they are open or shut. It has nothing to do with your voice, whether you say a little or a lot. And it has nothing to do with the volume, as if God would hear better if you shout or if you say a lot of words. It has nothing to do with any of that. I can only illustrate it. I understand this better now because I am a grandfather when, if you're a grandparent, you'll get this. If you have a four-year-old granddaughter and she needs life-saving surgery and you're in the room, when they wheel 
your granddaughter away to save her life, you will pray a boiling prayer even if no words come out of your mouth. It's what's in the heart that matters to God. The tiniest whisper on earth is shouted in the courts of heaven. That's number one. That's prayer. That's prayer. And it doesn't even require any verbal words. Number two, it's petition. And petition is begging God. It's asking. It's seeking. It's knocking. It's knocking on the door. Ask and seek and knock. It's, be- it's the answer to the question. This is what petition is. If Jesus, this helps me anyway. If Jesus were standing here right now, what would you ask him for? Do you remember the story of blind Bartimaeus begging, begging outside of Jericho? And he heard Jesus was coming Heard Jesus was coming. And do you remember what Jesus said? What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Rabbi, I want to see. Say it. Say it. Say it. Don't be afraid to say it. Don't wait for things to get better. Take your little cares to him before they become big cares. And let me give you this. Let me give you this. If you need a miracle, ask for one. There's no extra charge for large requests. If you need a miracle, ask for one. There is no extra charge with the Lord for large requests. Third is thanksgiving. Here is the real antidote to anxiety. I have jotted down on my notes. I just scrawled out here the side of my notes. Name of my wife. She's gifted in the area of gratitude and thanksgiving. I'm gifted in the area of complaining and worry. I'm only, really, I hope you guys get something out of this sermon. I'm really just talking to myself. This is just a little, trying to help myself here a little tonight. I've learned a lot from her. I have a lot more to go with Thanksgiving. It's the antidote to anxiety. It's the cure for care. It's the way out of worry. Listen, worry and gratitude, they really can't coexist. So what are you going to do? How are you going to get to the? I mean, when you're when you're up against it, how are you going to get from worry to gratitude? Sing a song, quote a promise, play some music, remember God's goodness, recite to yourself how God has helped you in the past, and this last one: hang out with hopeful people. There's a whole lot of grumps in the world, and sometimes we got to hang around the grumps. Don't let the grumps win. Find some hopeful people and hang around them. An ungrateful heart is a cold heart. Thanksgiving melts the icebergs. Ingratitude destroys the joy of the Lord. Gratitude brings it back. And the fourth thing he says now is request. I like this. This is a different word. You had prayer, you got petitions, now you got requests. This is a this is a word that the commentators say it covers the waterfront. It especially, I suppose, applies to urgent prayers, what some people call arrow prayers. As you're going through the day, you just need God's help. You need uh, you need emergency help right now. And you shoot an arrow prayer up to the Lord. Tell God every, every single detail of your life. So the other day, I was riding my bike, which I try, I try to ride about 15 miles a day when I'm home in Kansas City. And I was riding my bike, and I was listening to on the, uh, I was listening to uh, Majesty Radio from the, the one of the Moody online stations on the Moody Network, and I'm just riding along, and they they did a gospel song. It's a, I guess you, I guess you would, I guess a gospel song called Jesus on the Main Line. Anybody here know the song Jesus on the Main Line? Tell him what you want. Jesus on the Main Line. Tell him what you want. Jesus on the Main Line. Tell him what you want. Tell him, tell him, tell him what you want. If you're sick and you want to get well, tell him what you want. If you're sick and you want to get well, tell him what you want. If you're sick and you want to get well, tell him what you want. Tell him, tell him, tell him, tell him him what you want. Take your worries 
and turn them into prayers. And when you do that, when you do that, when you go from the prohibition to the precept, when you actually go through prayer and petition and thanksgiving and request, and when you take every little detail of your life, Jesus is on the main line. Tell Him what you want. Then you come to the promise. It's in verse 7. And the peace of God. Isn't that good? That's good right there. The peace of God. Remember, there's peace with God through justification. There's the peace of God that comes when we are fully connected up with Him. That's a moment by moment gift from the Lord. The peace of God, which what, what does it say? Which passes all understanding, which means the scientists can't figure it out, which means all the researchers, they can't figure it out. It's beyond anything that can be explained from an earthly point of view. The peace of God, which passes all understanding or transcends all understanding, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What he's saying is, when you take your burdens to the Lord, he replaces your worries with something much greater. The peace that passes all understanding. And you know, you've heard, you've heard your pastor say this, and when pastors say it, they're exactly right. It's a military term. It's a, it's a, it's what you do when you're in trouble. You think maybe somebody's going to come for you. You got to have some help. And you call up the SEAL team and say, come and guard my house. You call up the Delta Force and you say, come on guys, I need some help. Because if you got the Navy SEALs and the Delta Force guarding your house, you can sleep well at night. It's exactly the image. The peace of God will stand sentinel. The peace of God will be the sentry at the door of your heart so that worry and fear cannot come in. How? You will come up from bitterness, up from despair, up from anger, up from compromise, up from dishonesty, up from greed, up from pessimism. It is a promise of God if you will lay hold of Jesus by faith. And so this, my friends, is the promise. This is the big promise for tonight. You can have the peace of God tonight. If you stayed up late last night worrying, you can have the peace of God tonight. You can have it tomorrow night. You can have it the night after that. And, and no matter what, and, and by the way, by the way, scary things are happening in our world. We need the peace of God, don't we? We need the peace of God. We can have it. If we will just, if we just go right through this passage. You don't, you don't, you can't start in verse 7. You got to start in verse 6 and do what God said. But if you do what God said, the peace of God is going to come and stand guard over your heart. So, I told you last night about working at the, uh, the, the, the Chattanooga Glass Company the summer before. Marlene, or the summer Marlene and I got married. Well, this story is also a college employment story, but it happened about a year earlier, which would mean probably 47 years ago. There was a carpet mill in Chattanooga, Tennessee, called the Jorgis Carpet Mill. And they made, they made beautiful, exquisite carpet that was sold in the southeast, ultimately sold all across America. And their, their headquarters was there in Chattanooga. And they had a great big factory. And I needed some money. And there were some students from the place where Marlene and I went to school. They were hired out there. So I got on. And for a few weeks, a month or two, I worked at the Jorgis Carpet Mill. It's my total experience in the carpet industry. And uh, this will really surprise you a lot. This is what they hired me, a college boy, to do. They hired me to take a broom and sweep up all the stuff and then stay out of the way. Does that sound familiar? It's a gift. It's a gift. I'm talented in that area. They, they you know, just take the broom and sweep up all the, all the yarn and the little bits of carpet and then just stay out of the way. Do that for eight hours 
and they'd pay me. That's not quite as much as the one last night. Maybe, maybe $5 an hour, but for a college guy 47 years ago, they're still, they, yeah, yeah, they're still pretty good money. And here's the thing. Here's, here's the really big difference. But, but just besides the basic difference between carpet and, and Coke bottles, that the, the Coke bottle place was loud, but it was nothing compared to the carpet factory. That's the loudest place I have ever worked because they had these gigantic machines. Looms, I guess you would call them. And there were one here and one there and one there. And they had the spools of yarn. And I don't mean like this. I mean ginormous spools of yarn. And they had them stacked on top of each other. And as far as you could see, it was a real high ceiling. As far as you could see, the yarn was stacked up. And they had like seven shades of blue and like eight shades of red and five shades of orange and six shades of green and seven shades of brown and and then they had white and then they had several different kinds of black and I mean every color you could think of what I'm saying is there were hundreds and hundreds of spools of yarn and they were being it was being thread it was being threaded down into that that big machine that sort of automatic loom and it was here and there was one here and one there and they made an infernal racket unbelievable amount of noise and they were just going I guess 24 hours a day and you could look up and you could see the yarn the different colors were coming down at what seemed to be warp speed just coming and they're spinning like this and coming down and they were making such a racket and they were going in that they, they were going into and I was stand, I would my part was cleaning up the backside the backside of the machine which is where all the you know the the yarn or if the if the if the yarn came off the spool or if something went wrong it would always happen on the back of the machine so that's where I spent my days I would just I would I would just sweep it up all the time to, to keep it clear for the guys who ran those big machines. So it was unbelievably loud and unbelievably complex. And you saw all these colors just coming in at once. It was noise and lights and sound and, 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 uh, just all coming in so fast and to this machine and to that machine and to that machine and, and, and row upon row upon row. Carpet was here and carpet was there and carpet was there. It's unbelievable, believable what they were doing. And this is what I remember. When you stand at the back of those loud machines, nothing makes sense. Nothing makes sense. Because all you see is the yarn coming in, brown and green and red and blue at unbelievable speeds coming in and finding its place and lining up, but you have no idea what is being designed. If you want to see what's being designed, you've got to walk from the back to the front. And what made no sense standing in the back when you walked around to the front Row upon row upon row, you saw the most beautiful carpet coming together. And the brown in place and the black in place and the red and the green and the orange and the blue. Everything perfectly in place. And if you stood there long enough, you could see the design of the carpet begin to come to life. What was not evident on the backside was perfectly plain on the front side. The reason we worry is because we live over here on the back side of the machine. We live over here where all we see is just the, the yarns coming in with no apparent pattern and no apparent reason and no apparent design. And, 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 and we hear the noise and it is loud, it's overwhelming, it's all happening at once, and nothing makes sense at all. And no wonder we get confused, and no wonder we worry, and no wonder we doubt, because it looks like everything is completely out of control. But if only, you know, every once in a while, I do believe this, I do believe every once in a while, God lets us peek around the front, and we can see, get a little glimpse of the design he is making out of the seemingly meaningless 
strands of life. But we only get to see it for just a second. When we get to heaven. You know what I think we're going to spend eternity doing? We're going to spend eternity on this side of the great machine of God's design. And we are going to wonder together and exclaim together what a beautiful thing God was weaving out of the darkness, out of the brokenness, out of the parts of life that made no sense whatsoever. Here's what we are called to do. We have to live over here today. We don't have any choice. We're standing at the backside of the machine of God's eternal purpose. We know something's going on, but we can't see it clearly. Worry is what happens when all you do is look at it with your own human eyes. It makes no sense. But when you come at it with prayer and thanksgiving and petition, suddenly, suddenly, what made no sense, the Lord says, trust me, I know what I am doing. You see, watch this. God issues the same invitation to all of us. Take your worries, take your cares, take your burdens, take your anxieties, and what? Give them to me. Casting what? All your cares on Him, for He cares for you. Why would we lug that heavy weight when Jesus will do it for us? Why would we cling to our problems when the Lord of heaven and earth will do it for us? Why would we stagger under that heavy load when our Lord says, let me carry that for you? I was preaching on this, and a woman came up to me, and she said, Pastor A, you know what my problem is? She said, I have no problem casting all my burdens on the Lord, but I take them back the next morning. Charles Tinley wrote these words, If the world from you withhold of its silver and its gold, and you have to get along with meager fare, just remember in his word how he feeds the little birds. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there, leave it there. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you trust and never doubt, he will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. My friends, we have a great future because we have a great God. That's a promise you can take to the bank. Pastor Ray, what does the future hold? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But I know who holds the future. And that's enough tonight. That's enough. As the old chorus says, Cheer up, ye saints of God. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing to make you feel afraid. Nothing to make you doubt. Remember, Jesus never fails. So why not trust Him and shout? You'll be sorry you worried at all tomorrow morning. Let's pray. Lord, we do not pray for a lighter load, but we do ask for stronger shoulders. Set us free, we pray, from worry that strangles us, from care that consumes us, from anxiety that overwhelms us. Help us to cast our cares on you and then leave them there. May we go from this place with happy hearts, knowing that you will carry our burdens so we don't have to. In Jesus' name, amen.